and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers into the temple. They are the double-headed monster currently creating Worlds Within, which we'll be getting into today. In the red corner, we have Ben Collette, and in the blue corner, we have Andrew Christensen. Hey, how are you guys doing tonight? Very hey, we're good. doing good. How are you? I am, do I am doing good. Oh, it's been, it's been, a, it's been a interesting start to the week, but at the very, at the very least, um, Mother Nature hasn't decided to be on the drugs today. Tomorrow's another story, though. Isn't it always? Uh, and as far as which drugs Mother Nature is on, yes. Yes, even those ones. Right. <laughs> Can be the case. So I suppose I suppose I should start with start with the obvious question I usually ask whenever I have to deal with a two a two man party. Which one of you is the abbot and which one of you is the Costello? Well, according to that metaphor we just uh, visited a moment ago, I guess I would be the abbot. I am, as has been said, Ben Collette, the author and creator of Worlds Within. And I suppose I'm the Costello. <laughs> been the primary uh, help in designing things and then marketing and everything that nature since <laughs> its creation <laughs> and credit where credit is due he's he's been there since the beginning mm -hmm. and he's been absolutely supportive and loyal all the way yeah i i did get a bit of a kick out of the disclaimer that you that you put that you put in in the um document that you sent me um worlds within is not liable for fits of laughter emotional outbursts or any results of user experience <laughs> this pastime is not intended as a substitute for professional counseling or medical treatment of any kind. Consult a medical professional or healthcare provider for medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment. Any names, characters, or other examples are products of the author's imagination or used fictitiously. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Many bouts of laughter have already been had. <laughs> and sometimes bouts of salt. Oh, yeah. Especially when, especially when, pe especially when people think that the dice gods are on their side, and they learn very quickly that is not the case. Because <laughs> all too frequently, I have stated in the past that the dice gods are a model of equality, because it does not matter your ethnicity, background, occupation, what have you, they hate you. <laughs> I'm, I, yeah, I totally agree with that. Yep. I think we all can sympathize. <laughs> but they hate everyone equally. So, a natural point to go on from, from that is the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. So, uh, I'll start off here, Andrew, and if you want to yeah. hop in next. Um so now I know to preface, I know you've said uh, in, in a previous conversation that, you know, saying what we've been playing all our lives isn't necessarily the most informative. And I totally agree with that. But just to have it be said and out of the way, I grew up playing D&D &D most of my life. Um, I played, you know, and then when Pathfinder came out, I tried that. I, um, so primarily I played the mainstream role-playing games out there, but yeah, definitely uh, on and off for the better part of, you know, two to three decades now. However, um, the first gateway drug, if you will, that I'd, I'd consider my entry to the world of fantasy and, and possibly the, the very beginnings of role-play was before that. Um, I grew up abroad in Europe, so... Mm -hmm. 
different types of uh, grade schools and academia. But suffice it to say, um, in around, I want to say, fifth, sixth grade in uh, Vienna, Austria, where I was at the time, I think we that was there that we picked up The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. Mm-hmm. I think it was, I want to say, fifth grade. Anyway, neither here, here nor there, but the point is, is I fell in love with it. It's just a wonderful, easily digestible Tolkien novel. Um, just has really great pacing. It's short and sweet, but rich with a lot of, obviously, of the Tolkien's whole universe. And uh, really from there, I had friends that were also giant nerds like I was. And uh, yeah, it's just been, it's just been a wonderful experience ever since. And and frankly, in later years, I've come to realize it's more than just escapism. Um, while there is certainly a propensity for that fantasy, I would say that fantasy lets us also experience things psychologically we otherwise wouldn't or couldn't. Mm-hmm. I'd say that's an invaluable use. I mean, as it says in our, in our uh, game, I wrote... And part of why we have that, uh, uh, what was the disclaimer, is because there are segments, including at the very end of the of the system that we mentioned, I wrote out a segment saying, you know, be advised, role play is the oldest form of psychology, you know, in the form of storytelling around campfires and all that, mm-hmm. and lets us really get deep into the inner psyche. So, without meandering too much further. Uh, yeah, between novels and, and friendships and psychology, that's kind of what's not only started my interest, but maintained and grown my interest in the in the world of fantasy and sci-fi and, and, and all fictitious pursuit. Yeah. Now, with that in, with that in mind, it sound, since it sounds like you guys have been working on Worlds Within for quite a while, um, <clears throat> and I... Actually, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off on that because I just realized, <laughs> it ended up it ended up slipping my slipping my mind that it's the this is the problem when you've done hundreds of one on ones. Um, sometimes think sometimes things slip up. So Andrew, what about your origin story? Yeah, um, no worries. It it happens, and uh, yeah, I mean, I. I uh, didn't grow up abroad, and it was first introduced to to role playing in uh, high school, and um, you know, playing D and D three point five, and um, played that all through high school uh, with just a group of friends, a small group of friends that we played, and then, um. I went away for college and actually stopped playing for a long time until probably my junior or senior year of college. I've ran into a couple more friends and started, got back into playing. Um, I think it was still 3.5. We played Uh fourth edition was out by then, but none of us were interested. <laughs> um, and yeah. And then uh, it's just been, a pastime that that has stuck with me just because it's it's like like ben said i think it's a lot of the same reasons it's fun to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and to um try to imagine and experience things that uh, you know we can't experience (laughs) except in our mind so that would be you know why it sticks and why i think it's still a hobby that that I enjoy. Mhm. Now, that brings me to Worlds Within cuz you guys have mentioned a um essentially a D20 based background. And mm-hmm. unless I'm mistaken, Worlds Within is a D6 based affair. That's correct. So that's quite that's quite a that's quite a leap. So I'm curious I'm curious um if you guys had a, had jumped around between systems or or were you largely a D20 largely D20 lifers until starting on Worlds Within. Well, 
Um, like we said, we we are we're primarily these mainstream systems, right? But I think the reason we deviated from that was in large part because our experience was so. And you're going to hear me use this term. I use it with respect, of course. We all these previous systems, editions, games, wonderful sources of inspiration to where we're at now. But that being said, we also want to learn from our predecessors. And so when we had the opportunity to innovate our own set of rules, mechanics, including dice, we found some objective advantages to using D6s as opposed to the dice that we we become so familiar with and also become familiar with the limitations of said systems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the biggest thing with with that, it, you know, Worlds Within, to be frank, it grew over time with us, uh, you know, trying different things and, and designing it. And uh, for a while, we were using D20s, but we found that um, there's a lot of dead numbers in a D20. <laughs> you know, the difference between rolling uh, a 9 through a 16 is usually the same outcome and is no difference. And it's like, so why do you need so many numbers? <laughs> well, that and there's, there's um, quite a few traps in de- in design, and I, mo- I mostly pick on Monty Cook for that. <laughs> Mostly because around the third edition days, he had that ivory tower attitude. I don't see that as much from him from him these days, but you you know how it is. Old habits die hard. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Uh, and if you're familiar with Warhammer, you should be familiar with the Book of Grudges. <laughs> yeah, we've. Yeah. But. Since you guys are doing essentially a universal RPG, that brings a few things, because universal RPGs can go in a lot of different directions. Think of it as a pendulum. On one end of the pendulum, you've got something like Wushu, which is very, very, very light to the point where you could put the rules on one page. Mostly, And I know that because I did. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the other end, you have GURPS where you have multiple session zeros and eventually it becomes a cry for help and you have to break out the TI-83 you haven't used since high school. (laughs) Sounds about right. So, within that particular pendulum, where would you say Worlds Within falls into in terms of its complexity? Originally, um, and and I'd still argue it, it could could be the case still is it's much much closer to the wushu comparison if you will but we tried to find a nice happy medium where there's enough nuance to keep one's attention particularly you know if you're looking at turn order um, there's there's mechanics we've implemented in the game that allow you to act out of turn, you know, you can use reactions, that sort of thing, as well as that when you're getting attacked, it's you're rolling to defend every time, so it's going to encourage you to engage every time. Mm-hmm. Things like that keep, your, keep you engaged, keep you playing, but there's enough simplicity that we are very confident now, having done this very recently and numerous times throughout the years, having explained this to to brand new players that you can explain this in its entirety in detail in one sitting Mm -hmm. and every gameplay thereafter is just faster and easier. There's, there's a lot of simplicity and fun to this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, if a one is Wushu and a 10 is GURPS, where would you put worlds within? Andrew, what do you think? I would say we're probably three, maybe four. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So we're leaning again more towards the Wushu, but yeah, there is definitely, you know, it's not completely open, um, completely open, but it is very open. Mm-hmm. Something that we 
um, you know, it started, uh, the, the whole system started from uh, just an open, fairly, well, I, yeah, I don't even think, the first few sessions, we didn't have any rules, did we, Ben? <laughs> yeah, I don't think we, well, that was before we'd even... Right, that was before it even started, started that's where it grew that. from. <laughs> Yeah, we had, we had started an adventure setting that we were just kind of freestyle. You know how it is, Mildred. You you write some stats, or you don't even write stats. You just write your equipment on a piece of paper, and that's what you call your character sheet. I mean, it really wasn't the game at that point. But but from there, our uh, narrator, which is the world's within term for a DM or GM, or whatever you prefer, um, at that point had been doing such a good do uh, job um, being spontaneous and his improv was phenomenal, but he, he approached me shortly after we had started and we were having so much fun, but surprised to me to find that he was like, Hey, you know, a few more rules would be really nice. <laughs> so he, just, he was, there was so much, uh, onus on him to come up with every little detail that it was kind of stressing him out. So that was kind of the inception, if you will, of, uh, where World Within was conceived, we, we were playing a freestyle game, and then I reached into some old mechanics I had kind of developed independently to be backwards compatible with the mainstream systems I'd been playing, and dusted them off, started cleaning them up, refining them, piecing them up together, and one thing led to another, and here we are today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, obviously, the, fir the first thing that... I can, that I would have to go into since saying that a game is D6 based is a case of what my, what my brother Xanatrix would say is telling me enough to tell me nothing and beca mostly because you could mostly because there's so many different ways you can go with just D6 alone so absolutely yeah especially I, today too yeah yeah I'm only well, cons consider this. Shadowrun and Star Wars D6 both use six-sided dice. That is the only thing they have in common. I'm really glad you brought that up because that's exactly what I was going to mention uh, in, a, in a very similar fashion. Um, you were mentioning these other systems, and I, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, every role play is unique in its own way, and... And or every role playing game is, and uh, Worlds Within is certainly no exception to that. Mm. But I'd like to take that a step further. And, and before I say this next bit, let me preface with saying um, I, I'm not an egotistical person. Uh, in fact, I, I would go so far as to say I'm, I'm barely confident enough to acknowledge my insecurities, right? So when I say that, um, understand that it's not with a, a drop of ego or conceit that I and confident we are confident worlds within stands apart not just for being unique but for being a cut above mm -hmm. um, again we we've mentioned a million times i'm sure you've overheard in various uh, writing and, and videos worlds within was designed to have the ultimate creativity in conjunction with simplicity which are often mutually exclusive concepts right um, so Going back to the earlier comparisons, um, it, it really doesn't even line up with a lot of these games for a couple of reasons. One, because because of our experience with the mainstream games, we intentionally broke away from the patterns that they were forming because we wanted to do something not only different, but better. Mm -hmm. And then, as far as the 2D6 system is concerned, there are so many, like I mentioned just a second ago and in response to something you just said, today the, the games are exploding across the market. They're everywhere. And 2D6 systems are certainly not a unique concept now. There's, there's many a 2D6 system, particularly dice pool systems. But thing, a thing I'd like to clarify about Worlds Within that lends to that simplicity is it's only a 2d6 system. Mm -hmm. It's not a dice pool system. We have almost no rerolls. We cut down on the amount of math bloat, both in like health pools uh, and 
dice rolling, and of course, like I said, no dice pools. There's no other dice you roll for damage, and that's allowed us to do some phenomenally simple and, and effective things. So, yeah, like I said, 2d6 and only 2d6. Mm -hmm. um, but before I carry on, I'll, I'll let you guide the conversation. Yeah. So now, now that I have, th now that I have that, uh, and the and the fact that it, that from what I'm what I'm seeing, it is a um, it is a, a it is an aim high appro approach. Um, Absolutely. I am. I think. It, I think this is as good a time to to mention if there's any effects to consider if somebody's rolling box cars or snake eyes. So that's part of the unique mechanics that we've implemented that that are unique to using multiple dice, right? Um, with a single dice, you simply can't roll doubles, uh, whereas with our two d six, you can. And yes, doubles do have an effect. Snake Eyes, while we don't have a critical failure, we feel that it's punishment enough to have rolled minimum, so they don't gain the usual benefits doubles confer. But all the rest of the doubles in the game, be it combat or non-combat, confer a little boost or benefit that makes the game a little more exciting and adds a little more dimension to dice rolls. So, for example, in combat, you roll doubles. When you roll an attack, um, it's resolved by comparing an attack roll and then the opponent rolls a defensive roll. You add the corresponding statistics. We won't go into huge detail right this second, but suffice it to say, you contrast the two, and the difference, the one that's higher, right, is the victor. <clears throat> that number is used to reference a damage chart, and that's where all the damage is in the game. What this accomplishes is that whenever you roll high, it is always better. This resolves an age-old, super unrealistic, clunky issue that mainstream RPGs have always had, and that is separating damage with ac from accuracy. Mm -hmm. It is completely silly, because as you know better than most, I'm sure, you could roll very high and on your attack roll in one of these older systems, and then roll very low damage. And then in the next turn, roll lower to attack and roll higher on damage, which is just a complete unrealistic irregularity. And even worse, you could critical, <clears throat> roll terrible, and then critical and not critical, and roll better than you damage than you did on the critical. It's just, you know, complete inconsistency. This system resolves that. Not only do you not have to roll and switch to another dice type, switch to another set of mechanics that you add to the new damage dice. You don't even have to deal with all that. The more accurate you are, the more damage you do, period. And if you draw doubles, hey, you got lucky. So now there's a spectrum of little crits you can do in combat. And then out of combat, rolling doubles allows is one of the rare moments where if you roll double, you pick a dice, you re-roll it, gives you a chance to boost your odds. Mm -hmm. But it's up to your prerogative if you want to do that. Yeah. I can, I can certainly get that. Now... That move that brings me into this cascading effect that you kind of have with um, power, which leads into body and spirit, which leads into strength and strength and agility and intelligence and willpower. Um, I'd like to go into I'd like to go into how that's set up, but before that, um, how did you guys come come to the conclusion of doing this cascading? Because I I've only seen this kind of thing once in the last few years hmm. um if i could start i uh, yeah, go ahead. um the power tree and how we started all of our abilities goes back to where i said before where we started without any rules and um <laughs> ben wanted to he brought it up first he wanted to do a a foley point system um you know where where your your abilities well your where your stats really mattered because you know again we come from primarily D and D background and and those older systems similar based off of that and uh, where you have stats that then correspond to a bonus number and your stat number actually doesn't really matter other than it gives you this bonus number that <laughs> and we wanted your actual stats to actually apply 
and actually be what what mattered and so where you derived your uh characters abilities from and there was at that time before we even started looking at roles it was well what could we build a system that was just comparing stats to each other because when someone's stronger they're usually stronger and that's what matters (laughs) um and so and so that's where that power tree had its uh inception if you want to say anything more ben Mm -hmm. No, I think that's wonderful. And and yeah, you can call it a the power tree or the power chart or the cascade. That's a nice one. I like that. Uh, the power pyramid, yeah. Yeah, and and the way that came about is a minimalism, right? We I think we originally only had a couple stats, but of course, I don't think at any point we we came up with the two stats and just thought that was where we were going to end up. We were just I guess we were starting with as few as possible and then adding what was absolutely necessary from there. <clears throat> a way I'd love to depict this stat system is if you look at it, you you see there, oh, there's like power, body, spirit, strength, agility, intelligence, willpower. So you've got those seven statistics, which at face value might s- sound like more statistics than other systems. But Mildred, as your expertise certainly would lend to, you continue on and that's all of the stats in the game, you know, with the exception of ability creation and how they interplay with the rest of the character, you don't have things like skills, proficiencies, base attack, bonus, saves, on and on and on. And just a skill system chart was, depending on the system, dozens and dozens and dozens of extra formulas. So when I say that we have fewer stats than most systems, I, I think I know it's or you know what I mean, that it's really, in a sense, four core of, of the individual attributes. And then the rest of them are just recombinations of those four. Yeah. Now, would it be fair of me to say that power is equivalent to like an, like an overall level? Absolutely. Yep, you could even call it power level for you DBZ fans out there. <laughs> it's over if... 9,000! That's impossible! Saw that coming. (laughs) (laughs) I had, when I was run, because of the fact that Mutants and Masterminds has a power level set up in its own way, um, that got brought up a lot to the point where I said, anyone bring that up again has to, has to go through the punishment game. The punishment game, as I've mentioned on multiple occasions, is you have two choices. One choice is pain. Option A, drink a bottle of bacon soda. (laughs) Option B, drink the pain glass, which is a shot glass filled with water, salt, sea salt, pepper, black pepper, um, four different really spicy hot sauces, and ground-up jalapeno seeds. That sounds like uh, wake-up juice from Back to the Future. (laughs) Yeah, possibly. You're good, but I don't think Wake Up Juice had a regret after 30 minutes. <laughs> you know, the idea was make the punishment so much so much worse that nobody would think about trying it. That's understandable. We we've gotten compared, or rather asked, uh, so many times. You know, are are you like this game or that game? And of course, our answer is no. We are like our own game. We're not copying anyone. In fact. Andrew can attest to, I I was avoidant to go snooping in other game systems because I wanted to be as transparent and honest about my development and, and engineering of the game that I wouldn't be unconsciously sampling from everything. So we, I intentionally used the knowledge I had of these mainstream systems to avoid. Mm-hmm. So as we d- talked about earlier, the, the dice that basically the only similarities that we share with the uh, mainstream systems and, and possibly others is you roll dice and add a number and that's about where the similarities end. Yeah. Um, I did, I did of course notice that um, body seems to only have one value, but spirit seems to have a current and max um, value set up on the sheet you had sent. So is, is it a case where spirit, where, is spirit is spirit going to be rolled, or is it mostly a um, 
a resource that's utilized for certain actions. Yes. So, <laughs> as you said earlier, so both body and spirit, there's body and spirit, the combined attribute, attribute, attribute. Mm -hmm. The combined attributes that you use for combat. Um, the reason being is we believe combat is always a combination of the two correspondingly. You know, if you're swinging a sword, for example, in the most mundane terms, you're always using a combination of strength and agility. It doesn't matter which one you're more dominant in. Mm -hmm. And the same applies to spirit-based combat. One, one thing to preface, too, with spirit and our perspective it, is it's not necessarily religious or mystical or, quote-unquote, spiritual in nature. We use the word spirit in the broadest sense that it, it's like body energy or chi or whatever you would like to interpret that as. So that way it can really fit the aesthetic of your character. <clears throat> so both body and spirit can be used for, for uh, physical and energy combat, as we refer to them. But spirit's special bonus uh, component, if you will, is that it also represents... The, your total of spirit energy. Mm -hmm. And that's why we double dip on that term. And we feel it's very intuitive to that a person's will to persist and keep using that mana resource, if you will, which, if I'm not mistaken, in, in Hawaiian means spirit, um, is comprised of one's intelligence and willpower. Whereas your strength, its special little extra mechanic is obvious, or excuse me, <clears throat> body is is primarily more of the mundane you know grappling combat that sort of thing mm -hmm. now of course of course that brings that brings me to the um, attributes bef b below that so is is it a case where um power is the is the overall thing and that determines the amount of points you can spend on body and spirit and then cascading from down from there Yes. All right. I, yep. I, so in in that regard, it's it's kind of a point by system without the trap of point by systems. Yeah, you could say that. Uh, and that that brings me to the use of not the use of knowledge and the fact that you have the tiers of basic, expert, and and master. At, since you guys are familiar with Pathfinder, you should know how much of a nightmare knowledge skills could be could be in those games. Absolutely, and that was, yeah. So, uh, and Andrew, you cut in here anytime. I don't want to ground <laughs> yep. you out. I no, you're good. You being here, but <clears throat> yeah. So you're doing the you're doing this exactly how we do this, Mildred. Um, different order same result we have the four i break down the system in these what i call the four pillars which involves the statistics right mm -hmm. the attributes we just went over the roles you know the 2d6 combat challenges contests the knowledge pillar three if you will and mm -hmm. the ability creation so yeah jumping into knowledge absolutely um and Really, this is a special mechanic. All of them are, but this one holds a special place in my heart because it was a mechanic I had developed to be backwards compatible with other systems way, way back in the day because I hated those mechanics for their knowledge so much. They're just ludicrous, right? Sorry, what was that, Andrew? I was just going to say, yeah, I think it it's the... Uh the age old issue of, you know, the wizard who studied, you know, the arcane for his whole life. And then you go into a dungeon and you roll a one and don't know what these arcane symbols are. And the literally illiterate barbarian, this is Ben's favorite way of saying it, which is true, <laughs> rolls a 20. And somehow, you know, the DM has to come up for some reason why the illiterate barbarian knows what these arcane symbols are. And the wizard who literally is a master of knowledge on this somehow forgot. <laughs> right. It's so well said, Andrew. And and yeah, and it punishes the wizard because they invested in this aspect of their character and they didn't get anything. And it punishes the narrator because now the narrator, just like the damage critical situation, you know, separating an attack roll from damage roll creates the same issues to how you do you explain that 
And then it even punishes the barbarian because while the barbarian succeeded, it, it's breaking from character. And <laughs> it's just not even... Yeah, I guess maybe they could be used to move the story along, but it, it, it kind of pulls them away out of their character. Mm-hmm. And for me, for me, the issue is you're put when you have a, when you have that kind of skill point system and you're putting it in something like knowledge um you're you're investing points into something that is going to be very s- limited in its application that and the idea of having to do, having to do um that sort of knowledge role for a bunch of different a bunch of different subcategories the bloat with knowledge and craft can get ridiculous um, oh, absolutely. I remember. Absolutely. I remember Fantasy Craft trying to deal with this in its own, in its own way by having it as a unified thing, where every few points you got a um, you got you got a particular specialty when it came to craft and when it came to knowledge itself. Um, instead of instead of having individual knowledge skills, it just had a unified one with different subjects that you could um pick that you could pick out as you developed. Whether it be languages or al- or alignments or what have you, those are the those are two those are two ways that it can that it can be done. And of course, um, I think that uh, that knowledge issue was part of the reason why um, the Gumshoe system was made for things like Trail of Cthulhu and Esoterrorists. terrorists. You know, which hmm. w- because. If somebody wants to run something a bit more investigative, the way knowledge skills work in the in the world's most ubiquitous role playing games doesn't quite fit the fantasy. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah, so to get into a little bit more um explanation as to how the knowledge system works, and unfortunately this is one of the easiest to explain. So double bonus there. Um like you said, there's a student expert and knowledge tier to each knowledge. And we have a list of approximately a dozen knowledges plus an option to create your own. Um, We're big, big advocates for your own creativity, obviously. we It might surprise you to believe, though we loved homebrewing in the past, we do not believe in homebrewing in this game. We believe in making that the standard, right? So that's why creativity is so important here. It shouldn't be an exception to the rules. It should be the doggone rules. So, back to the knowledge. (laughs) Uh, It's as simple as each attribute has its own special extra function. I've covered body has its things. Spirit has its things, right? You don't just use them for combat. You also use them to, for example, spirit has its spirit energy. And the same applies to each individual attribute. Uh, The individual attributes are what we use for non-combat circumstances, which really allow the character to shine in their emphasis without lumping it all together and the uniqueness being lost. I'll circle back to why that makes body and spirit extra cool. And don't worry, I haven't forgotten we're talking about knowledge. Mm -hmm. But um, the reason I go over this is strength, for example, the individual attribute of strength, it lets you hit harder. It's part of the body score for physical combat but it also has its special benefit of carrying capacity, right? Very intuitive. We strive very much to be an intuitive system. And so that's, it's, it's one extra deal. And then agility, as you might expect, combines us with, uh, with body, into the, or excuse me, combines the strength into body to let you hit more precisely and more agilely and so forth. But its special unique characteristic is that you move faster with agility. Again, Mm -hmm. intuitive enough, point for point. There's no weird, uh, uh, what's the term, conversion rate, right, for points. Mm -hmm. And then going on down the list, intelligence. And and as you can see, Mildra, there's, there's explanations as to how to determine what a challenge role is going to involve, what it would be modified by. You know, like if if a perception role is going to involve willpower or intelligence, or maybe you're feeling something with your hands in the dark, you could be modifying a perception role with agility. So we have we have explanations across each of these individual attributes for those that want a better 
clearer understanding. But mm -hmm. moving on to intelligence, intelligence is, is unique function is knowledge, right? So for every point of intelligence, you can invest a point into knowledge. Cut and dry. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then just to finish this out so we don't forget, willpower Willpower is the amount of spirit energy you regain per rest. And we define rest very simply. There's not multiple kinds. There's just one kind. It's one hour of relaxation, downtime, probably sleeping, but not necessarily. You gain your willpower and energy back. And, of course, if we consider willpower, consider that willpower is not a du duplicate statistic of these mainstream Stats. It's not wisdom. We consider wisdom to be lumped together as a form of specialized form of intelligence, right? Willpower is the impetus to move forward, the will to persist. And so we felt it was very intuitive to have that be responsible for regaining one's spirit energy. Mm -hmm. Circling back to intelligence, each point of intelligence lets you invest in, in knowledge, and each singular point lets you either purchase a student level of knowledge, <clears throat> which as you see on the chart there is defined as a basic understanding of a subject. Mm -hmm. Or you could save a few and then upgrade a student level or purchase outright if you didn't have it in the beginning through role play, through explaining, hey, narrator, I'd like to spend this session working on this in the background in conjunction with adventure. We don't believe in grinding role play to a halt just because the rules say it takes 14 weeks to learn or craft something which is just ludicrous behold the power of montage <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but we like the mechanics to reflect reality a little more realistic even if it is still a game there's still some you know some gaminess to it and that's okay but we're we're adults we have lives we have lives outside of games and we we want to move things forward so it takes one session of off-screen, on-screen, um, montage if you will, role-play, to learn a subject. And that could be, like I said, either learning a new subject or upgrading an old subject. And the way it interacts, <clears throat> pardon my long-windedness here, mm -hmm. is a narrator very simply may present... Uh, well, actually, uh, Andrew has the most experience narrating He's a phenomenal narrator. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you tell us how you would handle this, Andrew? Um, well, so yeah, the, uh, the knowledge system is... I, I, it's funny you call on me to explain this. Because uh, <laughs> it was one of the things I was uh, somewhat unsure of in the design phase. Just because it... You know, I was worried... One of the big things... I'm getting all over the place. Is, you know, we're, we're here to play a game. And we like to roll dice, and we like to have that randomness. And, um, but I've come to love this knowledge system because, as I mentioned before, it, it helps hugely solve the issue of random person A knowing thing when they shouldn't. Um, but it allows you to, as he was saying, you you take a session and you say, "Well, I want to spend some time learning student um, nature because we've." I'm a city slicker character and I always have been, but now we're on this adventure and I'm out in the wilderness and I want to be a little bit more helpful. So, you know, I'm going to do this and it allows the character growth to happen and be focused in on the role play of the character in what they're going through. And so, um, that's, that's learning the, the knowledge, but then, yeah, it allows you to, in a situation as a narrator, you know, if, we come into we'll use the same thing we're we're going on an adventure we're going three days journey in the wilderness as a narrator i get to ask the players well what knowledge is uh you know okay we're gonna camp now and uh we're gonna set up a camp does does anybody in the party have knowledge nature to know how to find food and find wood and start a fire without you know whatever and uh and that gets the characters actually to think about it immediately instead of just them rolling and saying, yep, I can do it or not. Um, or the biggest tragedy of uh, fifth edition Rangers. Just ignore this whole part of the 
<laughs> pillar of the game of exploration. We're just going to ignore it because you have a ranger in the party. Anyways. Um, <laughs> Rangers have been allows... a problem since day one. <laughs> I <Right>? know. <laughs> But anyways, <laughs> but anyway, it allows yeah. you to get into the character and say, well, what does my character actually know about this? I, it has student nature, but let me get into the character's past of why I have student nature and what that really means to my character and brings out role play in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the follow-up question might be, well, how do you differentiate them, right? Is yeah. it all all on the narrator to figure it out. And the answer is kind of, but it is a lot more intuitive than you think. You know, most of the time, any narrator, even a new one, has some idea of how complicated of a, a subject matter might be. You know, it's like, oh, do I know what that mushroom is? Well, is it rare? Is it mm -hmm. common? That helps differentiate it, you know? And and I won't get through the exhaustive list of flow charts of how to determine this or that or the other, but again, it's it's pretty straightforward. So if if there's any hesitation of oh, I don't know if student would know that, fine, you know, just say okay, yeah, you are familiar with some things, but not all things. And then expert, of course, expands, deepens that, and master doesn't just expand and deepen knowledge of a specific subject, but like any real knowledge there's overlap. So for example, a master level in nature is probably going to overlap into some uh, holistic medicine as well, because they're going to have an understanding of complex natural compounds and how they interact medicinally and so mm -hmm. on. Yep. So, and it's really great. I love it. <laughs> something that I do have, I do have to ask is whether or not, there's going to be gu there's going to be guidance when it comes to filling in um, knowledge. I know that there's a short list of knowledge types on the thing, but more of um, if somebody is going to be adding their own particular knowledge fields, what's a good or be or bad um, ex example? That sort of guidance, I th I think, is necessary. Uh, is your question what? Um... My question is if you guys plan on putting guidance on the on um what on what degree of knowledge would fit say the fee, the different um tiers that you have of student expert and master uh um, the you go ahead Andrew no uh, you go you go you're good <laughs> um, no I insist actually I kind of forgot what I was gonna say you go <laughs> <laughs> all right um I mean. As far as student expert and master, it is um, it is explained a little bit, uh, in, in, very broadly, though. And uh, and so there isn't a lot of guidance there. But speaking as a narrator, and again, as I explained um, at the beginning, I was kind of hesitant about the whole knowledge system as we started implementing it back when we first were creating this. And, and I had a chance to, to narrate in the development of the system but i found um there's i mean they're the basic it's a line for each right so student is a basic understanding expert is an advanced understanding and master is a complete understanding and i found uh that with that you can and again i think the biggest benefit of the knowledge system is really asking your characters what they think asking your players you know, oh, you come upon this arcane scribbling on the wall. Um, you're not sure, you know, you look at it for a second and, and you know, what what knowledges do you guys have? And someone might say, oh, well, I'm an expert in the arcane. And so then I can say, okay, uh, with that, you know, you're able to recognize some of these symbols, but this is a, a very old arcane uh, depiction and you're not sure exactly what they all fit together and 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 it just flows and it, you can get in your players into their characters heads and uh, pull that information out so there's not a lot of hey this is you know everything that that is contained inside of an expert level knowledge and this is everything that's contained inside of a basic knowledge but um again when you're playing with people that are really there to tell a story and to grow their characters which is what we 
uh, think you should do. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, uh, I, I can get that. It's just for me, it's for me, it's all about it's all about making sure that that, that um, players and GMs have kind of have kind of a guideline, not a hard, not a hard and fast. Right. Yeah, and it is just a guideline of like you know it's uh what you would think you know a basic level of of subject means that you're above just having read a book about you know nature and you can actually do sub wilderness survival like you know how to build a basic lean to and find you know good things but like you're not going to be feeding a whole party of people out there and you're not going to be doing this and that but you can you have the basics down and so on and so forth if i may jump in here too um, for any of anyone that is listening to this and in, in future reference, um, there there absolutely is a, a clarity brought to the degrees, you know. And, and as Andrew has spoken to, if there's any openness to it, it was intentional. You know, we could have gone through and broken down exhaustively. Okay, expert means you know this up to this point, but it doesn't. But the absolute volume of detail that would have to be written in purely purely to facilitate someone's understanding would have actually impeded understanding because they would have been sifting through pages and pages of really contextual based understanding of what knowledge is so like like you spoke to just now Mildra mm -hmm. the the gen there's absolutely a general gist of it it absolutely delivers on the concept and we even have some some language written down below, expanding further of like this is not something you would roll about. You don't roll for knowledge. Um, you don't have to worry about knowledge if it's an inherent, you know, cultural background thing like a linguistics skill that you're just raised with. Um, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of dimension put into the knowledge uh, explanation, so no one has to fear uh, ambiguity. Or being vague at all. Mm -hmm. So, move. So, with that in mind, that's as good a time as any to go into the big elephant in the room that has decided to sit on my couch. <laughs> that being the abilities and equ and equipment setup. There you go. Yep, that's the big one. <laughs> it is the big one. The big Kahuna. Mm. Well, I'll kick this off. Um, yeah, like like you said, like we've all agreed, it's the big one. It's 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 why Worlds Within is called Worlds Within. I think uh, at a passing glance, people might think, "Oh, this is a world building system," and they wouldn't be wrong. I think a lot of people assume, though, superficially, it's just going to focus on building political. Uh, climates and climate, literal climates, and you know, terrain. And uh, no, we're, what we're talking about are the worlds within us, the psychological, if you will, and that's where abilities come in. So, I mean, I we we spent a lot of time refining everything that was written here. I I wrote and edited numerous numerous drafts before my my editor, my professional editor, even got her hands on it, and then she refined it even further. So that being said, I'll just read a, a short excerpt here to explain what abilities are and how, how they facilitate character creation and world creation. Abilities are personalized techniques characters learn to increase their effectiveness. Conceptually, abilities can be physical, mental, magical, or spiritual in nature, or anything you can imagine. Abilities should enable characters to do something they otherwise couldn't, enhancing actions using system mechanics. They should also be closely tied to a particular theme or aesthetic and developed through roleplay in the character's past, present, or future. Mechanically, abilities allow players to roll both dice, where applicable, to attempt to affect targets in a way their ability describes. Um, recall that actions without abilities, equipment, or other aid require players to set the value of one dice to one and roll only the other. Often, a relevant ability is necessary to even attempt a particular action. So there's a little synopsis of what is an ability, what does it help you do aesthetically and mechanically. Mm -hmm. 
and a big reason why why I wanted to focus on abilities is you're dealing with a universal system, which means that which means there the possibilities for both is sky high. So I think. Oh yeah. So yeah. I think it's important to nail down um, what can, what can be done with it, and also dealing with the cost of it. Because I've seen some games do point yeah. by, which is its own <laughs> kettle of fish. Right. Well, well uh, shall I, or do you, would you like yeah. to take this one, Andrew? I mean, uh, you go. I'll chime in if I think of anything. <laughs> you Sounds can start, good. though. <laughs> Sounds good. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, fill in the, the things I miss. Um, but yeah, abilities were where we wanted to start and finish with the system because, well, as you know, they, there's a, a plethora, a veritable cornucopia of, of ability mechanics, I use the term loosely, in other systems. You have, you have your attacks, you have your skills, you have your spells, you have your grappling, you have your saves, you, you know, the list goes on, and that's just, that's just the mainstream terminology we're using. Mm -hmm. And we looked at it, and I thought, gosh, why are there different, entirely different mechanics? You know, add this different number and multiply this number differently. And and you have a whole different resource pool for this one. And then don't even get me started on spells. They have a literal whole new mechanic for every single spell in the book that you have to reference, or you'll probably get it wrong. <clears throat> And I thought this should be easier. This should be simpler. Whether I am casting spell or swinging a sword or sneaking through a door, whatever, it's the same thing. I'm still exerting my mind and my spirit or my energy or whatever you want to call it. That resource pool should really be up to reskinning in my flavor and not be pigeonholed into a better or worse mechanic, which, as we know all too well, not all classes were made e equally. Mm -hmm. Some people, barbarian, <coughs> had <coughs> abilities that were just objectively more accessible, superior, and effective for longer periods of time with less investment. And then others, most spellcasters, and spellcaster to spellcaster varied wildly, had massive, exhaustive lists of predetermined abilities, spells, that uh, really were just always did what they did, and the, yeah, you could always reskin stuff in most role-playing systems, but it wasn't necessarily part of the system. It was mm -hmm. part of you. Yeah. So we just felt like, let's go with the one people are probably most familiar with, right? And uh, of course we tried other mechanics. Don't get us wrong. This isn't a, a system made out of ignorance. We were exhaustive in our research and perfection. There were many mechanics that we I stripped out of this game entirely because they just added mechanical bloat. Mm -hmm. It didn't really... Like there were one plus one plus two, what I call plus one plus two systems, where items added plus one plus two to your attack or proficiencies or whatever. Yeah, we and we realized... This is, sorry? I was just saying, yeah, we had a... We had a while there where we had a whole list of proficiencies and like kind of like a skill system that gave just arbitrary plus ones and plus twos as you yeah. leveled them up. But we found that they didn't add to character creation. They didn't add to character's identity, really. They were just, like you said, mechanic bloat. Right, and they, they added to the focus of the math rather than the role play. And don't get us wrong, we're here to make a system. This whole system is about the technical mechanics. But mm -hmm. the point is to make the system work for your role play, not in reverse. So, you know, we want to define things enough to to give you peace of mind. So back to the abilities, the reason I preface with all that is we, we picked a system that will make sense and resonate with pretty much everyone, and that's kind of the classic video game system. You do a thing, it costs a thing, done. You know, mm -hmm. kind of your mana pool or spirit energy pool, as we refer to it here. That's it. And so when you when you get to the nuts and bolts of ability creation, you you really just start like the chart says over here, a basic ability is going to have an effect, 
So that's what it does. It's it's the subject matter of the ability, right? And it's going to have a one meter range, which in some systems you may refer to as, as close quarters. That's what we call it here. You reach out, how far you can reach out and touch something. And it's going to cost one action, which we haven't touched on yet in this interview, but Everyone has two actions in this game. Mm -hmm. We have two actions and a reaction, and that's it. You can upgrade how quickly you can do abilities. For example, that reaction, you can use any ability that you upgrade to be usable as a reaction. That makes the ability effectively faster. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but as far as abilities, that's that's really it. If you have an effect... Um, and, and then the way you craft it is you, you pick an effect, so is it physical, is it energy, and then you put in parentheses, you define what that physical or energy thing is doing. Are you dealing damage? Are you trying to charm someone? You know, how you do you sneaky? interpret that? Are yeah. you? <laughs> exactly. any, are you? Any type of thing is right. really in the abilities. And you define whether you want it to be physical or energy. Again, there's a lot of leeway for interpretation. Interpretation is king in this. But mm -hmm. there's enough rules to keep it from being a mess, you know, where a player's like, well, I interpret it this way and and you should do it the way I want. It's like, no, the, the whole the whole spirit of this game from the get-go is collaboration. You're not playing against your narrator, you're playing with them and your party. <clears throat> so you, you choose your effect, you write down the flavor text, as you will, if you will, um, after it, the, the ability description. What you see, how that effect helps you or helps someone or does something. And then you go from there. Mm -hmm. you, you upgrade effects with modifiers. And those are all the key terms for ability creation. Effects and modifiers. I guess if you want to call descriptions one, but that's kind of yeah. a standard mundane term there. So mm -hmm. uh, you've got your costs which now we come back to what power does exactly, right? We discussed that it, it's basically the culmination of all of your attributes. It's other function, just like it, all the other statistics has a special function, is it is the resource that limits how many, um, how many effects and modifiers you can purchase. So right there, if you have a starting power, we are kind of a base 10 metric system here kind of game. We have a starting power of 10. You can spend a point of power up to 10 to buy either five effects and five modifiers or two effects and eight modifiers, any combination thereof to build into an ability or multiple abilities, your choice. You can spread them out, put them together, and that's how you build an ability. Mm-hmm. The only really, the only more advanced thing than that is that there are things called superior modifiers. Modifiers being the thing that modifies the subject matter, how it's done. So if I picked a, picked an effect of ideal heat damage, hmm. a modifier could be the ranged effect. This heat damage can now, well, oh, be dealt at range, hmm. and then I could pick a superior modifier. Whereas the range modifier gives me a limited range. There are, the superiors are a really big deal, and they're a lot more limited because they're so powerful. I could pick, um, I could make it unlimited range. So I could hit someone from almost anywhere. There are some exceptions, of course, explained in the rules, but that's what a superior modifier does. Yeah, and there's that's one of the few... We Another thing that we did in building this whole system is try to have as few, because we said so, rules or arbitrary rules and oh right yeah yeah and so one of them is the superior modifiers like you saying they are very powerful and so one of the rules there is you only get one superior modifier for every 10 power you have mm -hmm. just to try to keep things from because if you could just throw them on there willy-nilly you could make some broken characters very quickly absolutely um and and so as far as costs one power cost for an effect, one power cost, for a modifier, basic versions. And just like in the knowledge system, the level one version costs one, the level two version costs an additional two. A superior modifier, so like the tier two modifier, costs two. With the added caveat that 
Yes, it only costs two, but you do need its prerequisite, right? Hmm. To build up. So if something's efficient, which costs less, and then you make it inexhaustible, it needed to build up to that. So a total of one plus the two costs a total of three. And then, of course, the added caveat as well of gated behind that 10 power limit. So you don't start at level 10 and have, you know, a half dozen superiors and just make a ridiculous, crazy character. Now, limitations aside, you can do anything in this system. We have, we have run it through the gauntlet. People have tried to break this game. Now, are there things that are stronger than others? Sure. But like we say in our intro, this isn't a game about being perfectly impregnable. We focused on giving players power, literally and mechanically, mm -hmm. so that they don't have to worry about optimizing their character so much. They're more so worried about what they're doing and why. Mm-hmm. Yep. <clears throat> and then uh, further with costs, just to finish out, the uh, power cost of an ability is also its spirit cost, unless you have the efficient modifier and an exhaustible, which mess with your spirit costs of things. So, and that's how it works. <laughs> yep. Yep. So power is the learning cost and spirit is the using cost. And you can mm -hmm. interpret that what to be, you know, the aesthetic that fits your character. Yeah. And to be clear, when you use power, it, it's not spent. It's an equivalent amount, right? So I make abilities with enough effects and modifiers equivalent to the power I have. My power isn't actually... It's a budget. Yeah, yeah. it's a... Exactly. Well said. <laughs> mm -hmm. So... With that, with that in mind, I, I know that there were a handful of example, um, modif example powers that you had in the document you sent me. Is mm -hmm. that going to be expanded into the in the full book? So that the document I sent you, uh, for all intents and purposes, has all of the rules in their in their totality. There mm -hmm. now, it's just going to be a difference of formatting, as you've seen on the Kickstarter. We have some pretty uh, sample pages of what the inside of the book is going to look like. But we intentionally, like I said before, any anything that could be considered simplified or, or a negative term I, I don't like using is ambiguous in this. It is not. Um, mm -hmm. Because because the system reuses its mechanics for the sake of simplicity and making and, and intuition, the list of abilities we have is not just that, but every single monster we also included there has several abilities apiece. By the end of that, you're looking at dozens of example abilities. And furthermore, the ones we, we iterate in the abilities section itself are some of the most fundamental, but then we also have a whole bunch of crazy ones down there that you can sample from too and see how to craft your own. And then on top of that, equipment, is also using the same system, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where we, we connect abilities and equipment because the difference is you pay for abilities with power and you pay for equipment with money, you know? Or adventuring. Or adventuring mm -hmm. or <laughs> external resources. Right. But yeah, and it's I think the uh I think another big part of that is that you know, going back to the name, Worlds Within a big part of this system that we wanted to to bring forth was your ability to make the abilities you want and the world you want and the character you want. And so a big exhaustive list of here's all the abilities you could ever make is, uh, you know, we, we would never be able to do that. And we don't want to give, we to the point even that we don't want to give people an impression of like, these are sanctioned abilities that you can use. And, and we, we want you to create your abilities for your character. And so that's the the big thing we're trying to, you know, open up and let you do is like, like he said, we want you to home. It's not homebrew though. It's how the system works. We want you to make your abilities, not us tell you what abilities to make or how to. <laughs> yeah. Well said. Yep. That's, that's in essence it. So in conclusion, the the shorter list of stuff first of all isn't as 
isn't as short as it initially looks. It's it's quite robust. And but any any further expansion has been intentionally avoided because as we know, other systems will continue to iterate and recreate and really just rinse and repeat creatures, abilities, characters, items mm -hmm. for monetary gain. Yeah. Let's not kid ourselves. That's that's what they're in this for. Now, I'm not going to be a hypocrite and say, oh, I don't want money for this, you know, because otherwise I just give this away. But we feel like that we, we're trying to be as conservative as possible with the monetary side of things. Will we be innovating and iterating more uh, lists and stuff. We're gonna we're gonna leave that to the community. We're not gonna just be here and say, oh, we're not gonna give you the whole piece. You'll notice that our narrator's guide is included as part of the core book, mm -hmm. and the book itself is. I think a lot of people miss this half the size. I mean, length and and uh, width is half the dimension. So like, you take a standard eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper and fold it in half. That's close to what our book's dimensions are. So these this not too far removed from the dimensions of a like a manga volume yeah 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 digestible size you can throw that in in your uh you know your bro bag or your purse whichever you prefer <laughs> <laughs> and furthermore it's it's not just half the size and length either yeah, we're talking the the thing I sent you is, you know, closing on 70 pages. Now, granted, that's not the book format. We're going to put the book formats smaller pages, so it's going to spread it out. But all said and done, we're looking at around 100 pages for everything. And that's not because it's, it's uh, limited. It's because it's to the point. It's clear. It's simple. has everything you need right there. And we're not in this to release three separate... 300 and some odd page books that you have to buy all three and read a thousand pages exhaustively till you're an expert kind of money grab. That's not where we're at. That's not what we think like. That's not what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Now, and I'm, I'm guessing that's the same reason why you also have an abridged guide, which I guess would be your version of, of say, the, pl the player's guide um, book that, say, a lot of cipher system games use where it's just, it's just what's in the stuff but truncated for for um players in particular absolutely yeah it's it's you can and you could even use that as a narrator screen if you like you know and <laughs> prop it up but mm -hmm. that yeah that's absolutely right it's a truncated version it's primarily going to be containing a lot of the statistical without the explanation so that way if you just want to a super light, quick reference where you're not flipping through even the hundred, humble hundred pages. You're going to be flipping through, you know, maybe a couple dozen to be like, oh yeah, what was the chart? What was the range? But I guarantee you, Mildra and, and whoever tries this, it will become so intuitive so quickly that 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 reference is going to be very much all you need and very quickly. Uh, you wouldn't need that. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, there's all, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that you guys are setting up a app, which is certainly a bold move. So I'm curious <laughs> how, is this particular app going to be some, something that's meant to be like a character management thing? Is it meant to be both for both characters and GMs? And is it mobile exclusive? Are the questions that I'm thinking? So great news. This map, this map. <laughs> app is is already it's been out forever uh our software engineer is a badass that's braden on our website check it out everyone by the way let me put that plug in here worldswithin.net mm -hmm. i will put um, a link to the description in this video thank you um thank you. we've we've recently updated it we've never stopped updating it there's more and more information there's an faq section there's links to recordings and of course our team bio Hence my reference to Brayden. He innovated that app without provocation, for lack of a better word, within the first week of him joining the team. He was just like, yeah, screw it. I'm just going to make it overnight. And don't get me wrong. I say overnight. I'm not kidding. And it's not 
because it was bad quality. It's because he's that amazing. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. First, the alpha iteration, it's in beta now. We've been using it in adventures with all of our friends. It's a character management system. It includes spots. Not It's not just a dice roller. It's a dice roller that adds all your statistics intuitively. All your statistics are integrated with each other. So when you upgrade, say, your intelligence, it upgrades your spirit and power correspondingly. Mm-hmm. It has a spot for knowledge. It has a spot for your abilities and notes. You name it, it's got it. And it's 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 continuing to be developed and it's it's practic it's ready i think we're getting ready to share it with the general public or or the corresponding back backers i should say i don't want to cheat anyone out of the the agreements we've made so suffice <laughs> it to say the app is wonderful it's totally functional and it's it's coming out in a big way and it's primarily a, a character uh what's the term you use my brain just a character sheet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's primarily uh, character management, character sheet, uh, dice roller. Um, at least that's where it's going to start. Where it grows from there, I mean, we'll see. And uh, as far as I know, it's only on mobile. I would have to ask Braden, though. I'm not a software developer. Do you know, Ben? <laughs> um, as far as I know, it's, it's mobile at the moment, but I don't see why it's going to be uh, restricted to Exclusive that. that. Right. I won't. I won't make any promises one way or another. But it stands to reason with how amazing our engineer is and everything that, and how how compatible mobile is with PCs these days. Mm-hmm. That yeah, it, there's no reason why it wouldn't be otherwise as well. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's exciting. It's a. Uh, it's really good. Yeah. And so if if the system wasn't simple enough, we have a mo- an app to make it even simpler still. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it is the, you know, it is 2023 after all. And so we figured coming in, we should probably make a plan for digital stuff. But like uh, Libra mentioned, we had talked about that kind of stuff and wanting to have a digital system and stuff in place for things. But Braden, we decided to bring him on to do the website. And even before we brought him in, he was already putting stuff together and then and then, yeah, put the app together very quickly and got us all very excited about it. Yeah, absolutely phenomenal. Every one of my team members has been invaluable from from Andrew and his, his passionate support from the beginning years ago to, to the software engineer, Braden, we just referenced, to our editor, Susanna, who just incredible workhorses, all of them. Couldn't have done this without any of them. And... Something else I want to plug here really quick, too, with your permission, Mildred, is mm-hmm. um, we, we've we kept this on the down low because we want to make sure, you know, we don't overextend ourselves. But we are in the process and have been secretly, secretly setting up a marketplace website where we will be facilitating the sharing of third party content, not just ours, but a, a permitting and, and facilitating everyone else to be able to publish their own third party party world within content mm-hmm. that they can sell and make a profit off of as well through through us. So we want to encourage that community as well. And and that our dream for that site is not just to be a financial boon to the community and us, but also a means to network together where we have mm-hmm. some ideas on helping people get connected through worlds of Zen as well. Yeah. And, and I'm gl- I am glad to see that since that is something I've been keeping an eye out for. Cause I, f- I predicted it was going to, that it was going to happen. Um, just with, just with the way I was seeing the wind blowing for, for mm-hmm. lack of a better term, but sure. The and of course the um the reason why I asked if this was if this app was mobile only is because I've seen some that do that do that but I don't like using my phone when I'm GMing <laughs> and I don't like other people using their phones when they're GMing because or when they're at, when they're as a player because it's way too much of a um temptation easy Espec- out yeah <laughs> especially <laughs> especially since if I'm using a virtual tabletop if I need to reference something. I'd rather reference it on a different tab. Right. Because, Absolutely. 
can people play virtual tabletops like Roll20 on their phone? Yeah. I've yet to see mo many people do it, but the option's there. Sure. Oh. I, I can only, and I have a hard time envisioning it unless you've got a really, really big ass phone, like big enough that it might be one of those brick phones from the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> you've you've no doubt seen them, the ones that are so big you needed you needed a strap that looked like looked like a purse. <laughs> to oh yeah. Carry the thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, but um, most of our technological innovation probably surfaced for military use first, so it's no surprise that the civilian versions aren't far off from those. You could probably kill someone with this phone bricks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the app also, we're looking to have integration with the narrator too, so the narrator should be able to check up on your character sheet, help you with any questions, make some notes, that sort of thing. So that way everything's nice and connected and facilitated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely something I'll keep I'll be keeping an eye out for. And with that in mind, what are you guys shooting for as far as a page count for the books? So as we mentioned earlier, uh, we're looking at around a hundred pages is all, and that's the small dimensions. So very, very compact. Uh, yeah, uh, I think my editor has mentioned at most it's it's around the 120 mark, like just right around that ballpark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. I can certainly get that vibe. <laughs> and especially, especially since one thing I noticed in the doc that you guys sent is having, well, there isn't bookmarks on the side. Having hyperlinks in the table of contents makes my job a lot easier. Good. I'm glad you've enjoyed this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm big on navigation, and I've had instances with some PDFs or some books that don't know how to do navigation properly, looking at you, Palladium. Oh. <laughs> Where they, it's either a giant book that ha that doesn't have an index, um, or you have table of contents that are not accurate. Once again, palladium, or you ha or you have um, very large p very large page count on PDFs that doesn't have um, bookmarks. Oof. All three That's of rough. them are pet peeves of mine. <laughs> I studied web usability at a time, and bad navigation is something that will always trigger me. I don't blame you. Um, yeah. Especially, especially some of those like 500-page books that doesn't have an index. That'd be rough. That's brutal. Uh, <laughs> it's to the it's to the point where, um, I remember I remember when um Shiver didn't have an index, and I I had when I reviewed that I spent a good amount of time cut um just ripping into that fact that it didn't have an index cuz if I'm a GM and I'm and I need a specific rule even if the game is ridiculously simple I need that rule now right <laughs> right I don't care about all the extra fluff I need it now in fact I need it 5 minutes ago absolutely yep yep and that kind of speaks to what our bridge guide is going to be all about as well yeah mm -hmm. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you guys for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh, anytime oh. you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having us on here, Mildra. It was a pleasure. Um, I hope you've enjoyed skimming through this, reading through it. I hope you can feel free to uh, enjoy it at your leisure and, and share with your friends as well. Uh, any help we can get reading our, reaching our Kickstarter goals and reaching the community, muchly appreciated, of course, and thank you again. Mm -hmm. Yep, it was a pleasure to be here and excited to see where this continues to grow. Yep. So... And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. 
and there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>